Hi everyone, so this is going to be the beginning of our photosynthesis lecture series videos. So, the first slide here, photosynthesis, and I'm going to use capital P, capital S to designate photosynthesis, is the process that feeds the biosphere. <clears throat> All animals and most of our microorganisms rely on continuously uptaking organic compounds from their environment because these organic compounds, in other words, carbon compounds, will provide the carbon for um, cell skeletons for them and then also metabolic energy for their cells to do work. And so since early Earth, most of the organic compounds have been produced by what we call photosynthetic organisms. So in other words, photosynthesis feeds almost the entire living world either directly or indirectly. And an organism acquires these organic compounds it uses for energy and then also for the carbon skeletons by one or two major modes. Okay, it can be either autotrophic or heterotrophic. Autotrophic meaning that they are self-feeders and that they sustain themselves without any eating anything derived from other living beings and they get the energy from this, um, from the sunlight. Okay, so they will produce their organic molecules from CO2 and other inorganic raw materials obtained from the environment. They, in other words, are the, what we would call, ultimate source of organic compounds for all other non-autotrophic organisms. Okay, so we usually refer to autotrophs as the producers. Okay, almost all plants are autotrophs. Um, the only nutrients that they really require are water and minerals from the soil and carbon dioxide from the air. Um, specifically, we would call them photoautotrophs. That's why, we, why I have down here photosynthetic organisms because they are organisms that use light as their source of, of energy. And photosynthesis also occurs, oh, there we go, in algae, which are unicellular prokaryotes. And one of the most advanced photosynthetic uh, bacteria are cyanobacteria. And that just stands for blue-green algae. Okay, so they get their name from the bluish pigment that they use to capture light for photosynthesis, and that's called phyocyanin. But they also do contain chlorophyll A, which is the same photosynthetic pigment that uh, plants use. And so that's one reason why cyanobacteria is so important today. Um, the term algae just refers to any type of aquatic organism that's capable of photosynthesis. So we actually refer, we use that term quite a bit to, to um, just define something that lives in waters normally, not land, but they're capable of photosynthesis. We do believe that the chloroplast in plants currently is a symbiotic cyanobacterium that was actually taken up by a green algal ancestor of the plant sometime before the Precambrian period. Um, and that's what we would refer to as the endosymbiont theory. And cyanobacteria is often found on greenhouse gases or maybe around sinks and drains, but they have a very minimal nutrient requirement. So they will use their electrons from water and sunlight to convert atmospheric carbon dioxide into organic compounds, and that's something that we call carbon fixation, which is what we're going to go over in the next videos. Um, and then while splitting that water, the oxygen will be released into the atmosphere for oxidative phosphorylation in cell respiration. Okay, then we also have um, photoautotrophs in plants and other algae. Um, and so in plants and algae, photosynthesis occurs in a very specialized intracellular organelle. That's what we call the chloroplast. And it usually occurs during the daylight hours. 
And the evidence, again, this is referring to the endosymbiont theory, evidence suggests that chloroplasts are descended from oxygen-producing photosynthetic bacteria, or the cyanobacteria, that were endo endocytosed and lived in symbiosis with primitive eukaryotic cells. Okay, so the chloroplast is the most common member of the plastid family of organelles. And so plastids are, like it says in the title, it's a family of organelles. There's different types of plastids, um, and they're characteristic to the, the type of plant cell. So they are present in all living plant cells. Um, and each cell type has its own characteristics, but they do share certain features. So, for example, they all do have a DNA or genome. Um, but plastics within the same plant species will have the same small genome enclosed by an envelope of what we call two concentric membranes. And that would be like um, having two, you know, an outer membrane and an inner membrane. And um, so concentric just means you have two circles, like one's right in the middle of the other one, or right inside the other one. And so they are differentiated based on the requirement of the cell. So for example, a leucoplast is a type of plastid that's typically found in epidermal or internal tissues of the plant. And leucoplasts, they don't become green. So in other words, they don't they don't perform photosynthesis. Um, and a type of leucoplast would be in a would be in a myeloplast found in starch. So and I'm sure you guys have heard of the myeloplast. And so their main function is for storage, really, of just excess um, sugars. So so for in conclusion, plastics, they can have a few different functions. Okay, they can be the site of photosynthesis. They can also be the site for storage, like the amyloplast, um, and they can also be the site for other macromolecule synthesis, so amino acid synthesis and um, fatty acid synthesis as well. Okay, the chloroplasts, they resemble the mitochondria, but they have an extra compartment. So chloroplasts, just like the mitochondria, use chemiosmosis uh, to carry out their energy conversions. Okay, the chloroplasts have a highly permeable um, outer membrane, but they have a much less permeable inner membrane, and they also have transport proteins within those membranes. And they also have a very narrow intermembrane space in between that outer membrane and the inner membrane, and that narrow intermembrane space is what we call the chloroplast envelope. Um, and then finally, the inner membrane will surround a large space, it's a fluid, liquidy space called the stroma. And the stroma is analogous to the matrix of the mitochondria or it's analogous to the cytoplasm of the cell. So in the stroma is where the chloroplast also has its um, DNA, its genome. So it also has its chloroplast DNA, it has its ribosomes, and it has its RNA. Okay, so the major differences between the chloroplast and mitochondria then, because they are very, very similar, um, one of the major differences is that the chloroplasts are much larger organelles, and you'll see a picture that shows the size difference in a second. Um, the other difference is that the inner membrane in the chloroplast is not folded into cristae. Okay, so we're not increasing the surface area to have more electron transport chains. Um, but instead, the electron transport chains and the photosy photosystem light capturing systems and ATP synthase are all contained in the thylakoid membrane, which are in the thylakoids. And I'll pull up a picture of all of that. The other thing is, is that the lumen of each thylakoid is connected with each other, and we call that the thylakoid space. And so um, the fact that the thylakoid membranes can interact with each other, um, this is where we get those stacks of thylakoids, or often referred to as stacks of pancakes, called a grana. Okay, and so here's the picture of the mitochondria versus the chloroplast. 
right? So first thing you should notice, the mitochondrion is much smaller, much smaller. So the size difference is pretty noticeable. Um, both the mitochondrion and the chloroplast, they have their ribosomes and their DNA, okay? Um, and they both have an inner membrane and they both have an outer membrane. So there's the inner membrane and the outer membrane. They both have an inner membrane space. Um, the chloroplast is a little bit more narrow than it is in the mitochondrion. And then they both have a fluid-like center, but the mitochondrion is matrix and the chloroplast is the stroma. Um, and then the extra thing that the chloroplast have here is the thylakoid space because they have each one of these little green looking pancakes is your thylakoid surrounded by the thylakoid membrane and then these thylakoids can actually be connected with each other and that's what we call the thylakoid space. Okay, and so this these next couple slides are from the AP um, chapter slides. So I'm gonna go over those with you. So chloroplasts, those are the sites of photosynthesis. Um, and we're going to start from kind of macro level to micro level. So leaves are the major locations of photosynthesis and their green color. So, you know, when you pick up a leaf and it looks green is from the pigment chlorophyll. It's a green pigment within chloroplasts. Um, the chloroplasts are found mainly in the cells of the mesophyll. And we'll go over the cross section of the leaf which is the interior tissue of the leaf, and each mesophyll cell contains about 30 to 40 chloroplasts. So carbon dioxide will enter and oxygen will exit the leaf through a microscopic pore called the stomata. The chlorophyll is in the membranes of the thylakoids, and the thylakoids may be stacked into columns called grana. Um, the chloroplasts will also contain stroma, which is a very dense interior fluid. So here's the picture, right? We're talking about the leaves. If you blow up the leaf, and here's your cross section of leaf, okay? You have your waxy cuticle and your upper epidermis, and then you have the waxy cuticle and the lower epidermis, and then in the middle here, you have your mesophyll, right? The spongy area. And then within the mesophyll, all these little green cells, plant cells, and they have little green dots in them. Those are all the chloroplasts. And so the chloroplasts, um, when you blow that up, it looks like this. You know, you have your outer membrane, your inner membrane, the inner membrane space, then you have the fluid part, which is the stroma, and then you have a stack of green pancakes, and those green pancakes are each a thylakoid, and then, you know, immediately surrounding the thylakoid is the thylakoid membrane. And then if you have the stack of thylakoids, that's called your, your granum, okay? And so then the last thing, you know, on our cross section of the leaf is we have the stomata. And the stomata are these little, like, mouths almost to the leaf, protected by guard cells, which can open and close them. Um, so the stomata allows for carbon dioxide to be um, uptaken by the environment and then for the oxygen to be released as the byproduct. Oh, okay, we'll stop there.